And the idea that there was, say, a 2%, just over a 2% increased death rate in 2022, they're the number of people that actually died. It doesn't tell us the number of new cancers. So if 2% right. had died, presumably the number of new cancers is, is over, well over 2%. Well, my, my first observation on this was, what a pity they don't have the figures for 23 yeah. But then it was it, it was stopped at twenty two and then submitted and you know they had an awful lot of work to do. They realised what was going on, submitted, and it's been sitting on the server for months, which means that they uh, were having real trouble getting it published. Uh, it got published in Curious in the end, which is has a really open minded, hence the name, uh, looking at a lot of data that other people immediately form a prejudice again. So we know about that. We know that the, the medical prejudice and the inability to look at the science objectively has been a disgrace. It's occurred in Nature, Science, uh, Lancet, all the top journals. And it's not only in, uh, in our area, but I mean, it's well documented. If you actually think that the global warming is a natural thing and has occurred, and that CO2 actually is associated as a response to it and uh, have all the evidence from Middle England and try and publish it, it gets rejected immediately. If you present the same evidence and say more evidence that CO2 causes global warming, they, I mean, a guy actually did this to nature. I mean, and they published the one supporting global warming but constantly rejected the interpretation that it was a, a, an associative, it was not causal. But we're concerned it's the same in medical journals as well because uh, of the compromise. And, uh, of course, we all know the saying that uh, he who pays the fiddler has nothing to do at all with the tune that's chosen. <laughs> well, exactly. If, if well, only. <laughs> well, we know who owns all the uh, the major journals now. I mean, a massive influence. And I'm, I'm sorry to actually say, I mean, it, it's the Chinese. Uh, have a major impact with, uh, on the... Uh, Nature, for instance, the, 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 when the new editor was appointed, the first thing they did in the article was boast, boast that when the editor that was appointed, less than 1% of papers came from Chinese universities. Now, since they've been there, they're delighted to say that now 20%, uh, within a year, have come from Chinese. Uh, yeah. it, Lancet, I mean, it's a disgrace. Mm. Uh, Horton. Um, basically accepted being a, a really high Academy of, the, of Science award from China. I mean, this guy's no scientist, he's an editor. <laughs> and that has affected what he publishes. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't, wouldn't entertain about the origin. We know that because he rejected it. The oh, same yeah. thing, the bad things with lockdown, possibilities of vaccine. Whoa, you, you weren't allowed to say. It was a censorship of all these journals. It was frightening. But this Japanese paper, I mean, I read it, and if I was peer reviewing it, I would have published it without hesitation. It's a very, very thorough. It is very, very thorough, and it's warts and all. It is. Uh, it, it actually uh, sees things that you wouldn't expect. Mm. Uh, what we're getting is people only want to publish uh, things that agree with their preconceived uh, political philosophies of mm. life, science, or whatever. I mean, my very basic knowledge of cancer tells me that if someone gets a, an unexpected deep venous thrombosis, um, I, I refer them to a physician um, because cancer is often associated with thrombus, isn't it? The, the, the clotting of blood in the blood vessels. And am I right in thinking that's a common cause of death in malignant disease? It is indeed. In fact, um, uh, it goes across all cancers. But, you know, from my training, I remember specifically with that uh, prostate and pancreatic cancers are really associated with increased clotting, unusual clotting patterns. In, in prostate, when it uh, goes stage four, they get disseminated intravascular coagulation and uh, uh, all, all sorts of uh, problems, very difficult to treat. And pancreatic cancer is associated with a great increase in clots. And what this paper uh, very originally uh, points out, and I must say I did not, when I was listing all the ways that this could uh, cause this increase in cancer, I did not, in spite of what I've just said, uh, I know all this background, I didn't link it to the fact that 
These uh, spike proteins and nanoparticles induce microclots. That's been the, the reason for the inflammation of the lungs in an acute COVID, and that's been the, an explanation for uh, microclots, mini strokes, etc. And uh, I mean, he openly discussed the neurologists that it's associated with microvascular uh, dementia uh, being driven by this process. So it is, it is a process that could easily disseminate cancer. So, you know, full marks to them for thinking that one through. Yep. So, so there's cancer that's already causing blood clotting. Mm. And this, this, for all we know, there could be an additive or a synergistic effect. Mm. With, with the spike protein, which also causes blood clotting. Yeah. And that could have been responsible for some of the early deaths. We're not on, told that, unfortunately. That's, it's a very good point, because the, the, the cancers per se, I wouldn't expect to cause deaths in a significant percentage in the first year or two. But you are, well, they are seeing it, they chart it. And the other thing with Japan is it's very, very advanced medically. I mean, it's, and in terms of statistical data collection. Yes. But those guys will all have had the best treatment. So it's, it's, not, it's not like I strongly suspect to see that when we can uh, tease them out, the figures will be an awful lot worse for the UK for the same thing. Because well, 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 quite. These people have died in Japan despite excellent uh, yeah. medical care mm. and yet still a high death percentage. Yeah. And therefore, that underscores how important this paper is yeah now you mentioned there a condition called dic this stands for disseminated intravascular coagulation yeah where basically there's it's, it's disseminated so it's all over the body it's intravascular so it's inside the blood vessels mm. and it's coagulation so it's little blood clots mm. now this is interesting because i interviewed uh tom haviland major tom haviland mm. who's collected data from a lot of embalmers now, before the pandemic, the embalmers saw a very small amount, just a few percent of what they call dirty blood. It's got lots and lots of little clots in it. But since the pandemic, uh, in, in their, or, or rather not, not since 2020, but since 2021, 2022, 2023, they're seeing of the bodies they're embalming up to 20% have got this dirty blood, which presumably is, is due to this disseminated mm. intravascular coagulation, which could well be a spike protein. And of course, it uses up all your clotting factors so that people can that, that's right bleed yeah. to death readily and the, uh, the irony is by over clotting you can bleed to death yeah <laughs> which is I mean it's this part of the biological paradox is that mm. see that uh, the, you know immunodeficiency immune suppression is nearly always preceded by some form of immune activation inflammation yeah which i've uh, discussed before how that has the knock-on effect of causing this and that's, of course, what the vaccine is doing. It's causing extra activation, inflammation, to try and get more antibodies against the virus that doesn't exist. But actually, all that causes extra fuel, which stimulates things that should have been left alone. Yeah. And, of course, when people get disseminated intravascular coagulation, the outlook is, is dire, isn't it? They don't, Very dire. They're, they're, not, they're not going to typically do, do well on that. So I think it was quite interesting the, the, the way they, they thought of this and the way it, it just occurred to me the way that that ties in with it with the post mortem data was was quite interesting. Now, well, the, if I could just uh, mention the, the uh, there's been several reports from uh, uh, pathologists and they've not been allowed to proceed with it that they've seen it's not just intravascular uh, coagulation but just very long, long clots in the major vessels, they're pulling them out like a chewing gum and incredible. And uh, this is real. I mean, it's, it's been very hard to publish that. Again, this seems to be censored. But it is real because I've had it from the, from the mouth of undertakers. Yeah. Undertakers. I, I, as yeah. have I. I as have I. I I've talked to, uh, to, to Richard in the States, Richard Hirschman, John O'Looney in the UK and Major Tom Haviland, who's collected a lot of this data. And, and again, um, embalmers are seeing this in, in over 20% of their corpses. And when I heard this, I thought, well, this is a bit strange, these long stringy uh, clots. So I rang our local undertaker, a friend of mine who was a local undertaker, who was a manager, um, and he rang his embalmers. And again, he was seeing it locally in about 20% of... Uh, bodies that it was embalming and we know we know that these clots now are almost certainly made of 
amyloid protein. Mm. Obviously, with a few platelets and a bit of uh, a bit of um, um, th- th- um, what do you call it? Th- um, the end product, the fibrin. Fibrin, fibrin, and fibrin. Is yeah, fi- fi- fibrin and uh, platelets. But the, the amyloid, we know that can potentially be made from the genetic instruction of the virus by what's called frame shifting. Yes. Yeah. So again, th- these are plausible mechanisms. The disseminated intravascular coagulation in twenty percent of bodies, mm. the the amyloid long stringy uh, squid type clots, mm. it, it all it all kinds of hangs together. Now, th- the other thing that this Japanese paper did was they, they looked at various um, oncogenic possible mechanisms, um, cancer causing mechanisms. So, so one is the influence of multiple mRNA lipid nanoparticle vaccine doses and they talked about how many they were and one thing they said that was really interesting um, the, the Pfizer vaccine contains 13 trillion molecules or 13 trillion of these little nanoparticles the Moderna 40 million and now we know that's systemically distributed uh, this goes round the body and the figure they quote <laughs> you see different figures but they say 37.2 trillion cells in the body Mm. So this has got the potential to infect billions of cells all around the body, potentially causing um, malignant change in cells that it infects, meaning we could see a wide variety of cancers. Is that feasible? Yeah, I, this is my fear. Um, I try to keep it <laughs> quiet unless I'm trying to get across to people who should know better and be making decisions on all this, that they must not continue with this vaccine. Because the, most cancers take years to, it, to induce, because there's a lot of systems there to prevent the cancer forming. I mean, to put it very bluntly, we have a, a big repertoire of suppressor genes. Uh, these guys, they spot, a, say, like a RAS mutation, the sort of first mutation for a colorectal cancer or a lung cancer or pancreas, for instance, and they will go in and try and the cells with this try and suppress it so it gets switched off. My big fear was, and this has not been collaborated, but it comes from good science scientists who I would take seriously anything that they say we are seeing this. They have reported that the spike protein binds to p53 and msh3 p53 was the first suppressor gene found that controls cancer i mean it was a really big nobel prize winning stuff it was that that important we now know there's a whole host of other ones and the msh3 this this was the one they specifically found is part of a thing called uh, microsatellite uh, 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 suppression genes associated with colon cancer. So if you have a, a mutation in that, then you know, you're more likely to uh, lose control of the cancer. And for the spike protein to bind to not just one, but two really important things, I must say, I thought, oh, what are we in for? I mean, re- remember, It took two or three decades before they accepted that smoking caused lung cancer, even though the the, 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 the bright people who knew were strongly suspecting it, you know, by 10, 20 years. Um, It took uh, um, asbestos exposure and mesothelioma. I remember I was alive because people kept saying that they're associated, and they did a study and they monitored it over 20 years and said, no, no, there's not enough evidence. It doesn't stack up. By 25 years, this is the interesting thing, it was bloody obvious to everybody. That, and it was a measure of how long it took before the, the expression, the, the tumour escaped, these various controls. So when we were, got the potential to interfere with the natural controls, you know, my worry is that we prob- we might not have seen anything yet. You know, we're just stu- we're just seeing the, a few icebergs as we sail across the Atlantic, and the uh, the big ice sheets uh, that have yet to come. That's that's my real worry. I, I, yeah. It really does uh, disturb me. 
No, I, I agree. From, from memory, Richard Doll and Austin Bradford Hill published the first paper linking, uh, caus- causally linking smoking and lung cancer in 1952. And uh, uh, let, let's just say it wasn't welcomed with open arms by the tobacco industry for some time. But well, they, get- they fought, it's very interesting in the industry, they fought tooth and nail to discredit the information. They paid people to uh, you know, challenge it produce paper, uh, papers saying, no, it doesn't. It's exactly the same as going on with Pfizer and Moderna uh, and uh, vaccine damage today. 